Uh, all right, good evening. Uh, welcome everyone to the New York Studio School's uh, virtual fall evening lecture series. Uh, tonight, we are very excited to be joined by Elisa Lagama presenting Sahel Art and Empires on the Shores of the Sahara, which you can see on your screen. Um, this, ex this talk is one of a few this season that are uh, carryovers from the spring that were, were you know, delayed because of the pandemic. So it's extra special that we have Elisa here and that the exhibition is actually still available in, on view for you to go see at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, it's, it's up through October 26th and um, it's an incredible show. Um, I encourage you to make a reservation through their website sooner rather than later as always, you know, uh, weekends tend to, the final weekend is always packed. And if you're not in New York, I'm really excited that uh, you've tuned in. And um, I wanna thank Elisa for, for taking the time. And I'd like to thank all of you as well, as I know there's a lot of Zooming going on. Um, before I introduce Elisa, I would just like to also thank um, the, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Robert Lehman Foundation, and many, many of the individual contributors that helped make this lecture series possible. Um, the, deeply, the, the Studio School is deeply grateful for all of our public support of our programs. And um, please do consider making a donation during or after tonight's talk by clicking on the support button on our homepage at www.nyss.org then just click on the donate button. Um, and uh, we are very grateful. Um, I'll give a quick, I'll give an introduction of Elisa. And then um, I just also wanna bring to your attention at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q and A button. Um, Elisa will take questions at the end of the talk, um, but feel free to, to go ahead and type in any question that you have as the lecture goes on. And I think we can also revisit slides um, after the talk. Um, and with that, um, Elisa Lagama is the Seal and Michael E. Pulitzer Curator in Charge of the Department of the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Her work there over the last 20 years, her work there over the last 20 years, expanding the collection and developing a dozen influential e exhibitions has been instrumental in rethinking plans to ground sub-Saharan African art and culture historically and the plans to rethink the Met's permanent galleries. In 2012, the Bard Graduate Center recognized this with the Iris Award for Outstanding Scholarship. Among her most recent projects is uh, Sahel Art and Empires on the Shores of the Sahara, which is on view now. Uh, the exhibition, I believe in 2015, Congo, Majesty and Power received critical acclaim and its publication has been recognized by the George Wittenborn Memorial Award, the International Tribal Art Book Prize, honorable mention for the Prose Award and finalist for the College Art Association's Alfred H. Bard Junior Award. The Gamma's heroic Africans, legendary leaders, Iconic Sculptures received the 2012 International Tribal Art Book Prize, and in 2000, 2007, the Association of Art Museum Curators recognized Eternal Ancestors, Art of the Central African Reliquary as one of the profession's outstanding exhibition catalogs. Lagama is a 1988 graduate of the University of Virginia and received her MA and PhD in Art History from Columbia University. Her 1995 dissertation, The Art of the Punu Kuj Masquerade, Portrait of an Equatorial Society, was based on a year of fieldwork in Southern Gabon. Born in Lumbashi, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Lagama spent formative years living in Cote d'Ivory, Senegal, Nigeria, Togo, and South Africa. Uh, and Elisa also has the unique distinction of being uh, one of our honorees for the New York Studio School's virtual fall benefit later this month on October 29th. Um, and with that, please give a virtual welcome to Elisa Lagama. 
Thank you so much, Sam, for that introduction. And it really is such a pleasure to be reunited with members of this community on a regular basis. Um, I'm sorry that this year it has to be virtually, but um, it's uh, very much a source of uh, immense pleasure to be able to share with you my current project. Uh, and I'm going to take you through on somewhat of a gallop through an exhibition that spans thousands of years and a vast region of sub-Saharan Africa. Now, um, the title um, Sahel uh, situates this project geographically. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, the Sahel is the name that Arab travelers who crossed the Sahara Desert um, gave to the lands that they reached once they crossed that vast body of sand um, that they likened to an ocean. And when they arrived at the other end um, to what is Today, uh, Mali, Niger, Senegal, Mauritania, uh, they referred to it as a shoreline or Sahel. And uh, one of the things to uh, situate you in this narrative um, that you should know is that um, a mighty river um, extends through this very arid landscape, uh, the Niger River. And before Arabs began their regular journeys across the Sahara, linking this region to Europe and beyond uh, and making it a global crossroads uh, beginning in the late seventh century, this was the cradle of an important civilization that um, gave rise to a succession of mighty city-states or empires. And so by the time Arab travelers first started visiting this region, we have in place uh, important states that become their trading partners. Now, um, one of the things um, that is very striking about the landscape of the Sahel is that, um, well, first of all, its earliest settlers were semi-nomadic pastoralists um, who uh, measured wealth in precious stones and in cattle. Uh, and um, what looks like um, natural formations in the landscape in these um, turn of the century photographs is actually they're reshaping the land to create earthworks, um, man-made commemorative monuments um, that were that we refer to as tumuli, within which they buried their dead. So um, we have a reshaping of the landscape, and in relation to one of these um, ancient commemorative mounds that go back thousands and thousands of years um, to around. Um, 2000 BC, we have um, the casual discovery of what is likely one of the earliest figurative representations produced in this region. Uh, and you know, in this virtual presentation, it's hard to get a sense of scale, but the image that I have on the screen right now is a pebble. Um, it is a tiny, stone um, that someone as many as 4,000 years ago 
picked up on the surface of the ground, um, saw in it figurative qualities and engaged in a very strategic intervention to underscore those human qualities. And so you can see with lightly engraved lines, the definition of the contours of a stomach and thighs. And this headless figure uh, gives us a sense of the fusion of male and female into a miniature representation that probably has to do with um, ideas of regenerating life and procreation in the Sahel and the beginnings of um, symbolic um, representation uh, in this part of the world. Now, um, one of the things that I love about uh, the way that we've um, installed this exhibition is that you at near the entrance, you have a confrontation with this miniaturized representation and a colossal one. Uh, and in addition to those earthen tumuli that were basically mounds of earth or sand, um, another kind of open air installation that was produced in this region in antiquity was that of um, stone megalith circles. Um, and here on the left, you can see one of those in present day Senegal. There are around nine, 90 of these open air sites um, across Senegal and, and the Gambia um, that were um, put in place by local inhabitants um, as early as the late seventh century. And uh, we don't know exactly the significance of these sites, what happened there, but doubtless they were um, places for people to gather on port important ceremonial occasions. And um, in order to um, create a sense of place and the distinctive character of visual representation in the Sahel, we transported one of these three ton megaliths from the entrance of the museum in Senegal in downtown Dakar uh, by sea. Um, it was a, a lengthy journey um, by ship uh, to the Metropolitan where you can see it at the entrance to Sahel. Um, this was uh, quite a feat of engineering as you can see the museum's rigors um, trying to um, raise it into place. Uh, and uh, the material that this rugged monument is composed of um, is that of mineralized soil, um, iron oxide earth, that um, the author of this monument um, that required him to use um, tool, iron tools um, and essentially he carved this out of the earth. And um, the form, um, I think that I'm obscuring the um, landmark um, with my pop-ups, but the form is that of a lyre, an enormous um, musical instrument um, that is quite fitting uh, as uh, part of the way in which history is recounted in this region uh, because 
until Arab travelers arrived in this region and introduced literacy, um, history was relayed orally by bards uh, who were accompanied by musical instruments in their telling of important events of the past. Um, and so um, to open this presentation with a majestic and um, imposing musical instrument is um, uh, a way of underscoring um, a very different um, approach to thinking about the past and its visualization. Uh, now, so at, set at the introductory um, point in this installation, um, which is very beautifully designed by a colleague of mine who is a young architect um, from Argentina, um, who was very inspired by the aesthetic of this region. We have these beautiful curved rounded walls that line uh, essentially an avenue that bisects the um, exhibition space. And he was inspired by the very soft rounded contours of the adobe architecture that um, is um, identified with this region. Um, and what we did, which um, is dear to my heart, is we created a, um, a procession of majestic uh, mounted equestrian warriors that um, take you on a journey from the distant past to the more recent past. Um, and so uh, this, what I refer to as the cavalcade um, is a journey through the successive layers of history um, that um, comprise the Sahelian past. Um, so you can see that on the right hand side of the exhibition, the installation is organized chronologically and on the left thematically, um, underscoring different aspects of the Sahelian past that allow us to understand um, what unfolded in this region that is so unfamiliar to so many. Okay, now um, the national treasure of Niger uh, kicks off this procession and uh, this is a, an ancient terracotta creation that was produced as early as the third century. Um, and it was unearthed by archeologists. Here you see a photograph of it uh, right below the surface of an ancient necropolis, a city of the dead, where hundreds of elite members of an ancient civilization that flourished in the Sahel early on were they uh, known as Bura, were buried. And um, here you see um, a mounted um, figure who's elaborately dressed um, as is his horse. Uh, and there's a great deal of artistic license that the author has taken in terms of the elongation of the arms to underscore this, um, this connection between man and horse and that of his mount's muzzle. Um, horses were the most valued commodity imported into the Sahel um, as far back as um, the third century BC. Um, they were imported from the Arab world across the Sahara. And uh, 
We historians have suggested that until the 13th century, um, they were a prestige good um, whose depiction uh, underscored the wealth and power of the writer, but um, that from the 13th century on, uh, they become part of the cavalries of regional courts that give leaders a military advantage over their neighbors. Um, and so um, this is, um, you know, right now we're having very important conversations about equestrian monuments across the US and um, the depiction of uh, Confederate leaders and um, this is a tradition of equestrian monuments that develops completely independently of the Western uh, tradition of uh, equestrian monuments and gives us a very different vision um, and association uh, that is um, very relevant in this particular moment in time. Now, um, the, the work that um, we borrowed from the National Collections in Niger, it's the first time it's traveled uh, to the United States and it is the earliest depiction that we know of this very important subject that runs throughout the subsequent history of artistic expression in this region. And the material that that equestrian is shaped from, the local clay, is also the idiom that, um, as I mentioned before, is um, the vernacular used to build architectural monuments that are so distinctive in this region from private residencies to mosques to shrines. And um, these structures that I have on the screen um, are all composed of sun-dried bricks uh, but their exposure seasonally to rain uh, causes them to melt. And that carries with it the requirement of a, an annual resurfacing. And so um, this is a region where monuments are mutable. Uh, uh, some of the great landmarks of architecture produced in this region um, are credited to the sponsorship of leaders who built them in the 13th century. But given the creative process with refurbishing them, uh, we know that they probably look nothing like what they looked like in the Middle Ages. And so it's really interesting to think about the, the idea of an art history that is ancient and yet is contemporary on an ongoing basis. Uh, and uh, that holds true for the professional bards or historians at the courts of leaders in this region um, who accompanied uh, the telling of epics like that, um, the ones that we're familiar with, the Iliad and the Odyssey, Beowulf. Well, in the Sahel, um, one of many celebrated epics is that of Sundiata, the Malian emperor who founded um, his people state uh, in the 13th century. And to this day, the Malian empire is the largest state that ever existed 
in sub-Saharan Africa uh, and spanned uh, what is today uh, Mali, um, Guinea, Niger, and um, parts of Mauritania and Senegal. Um, so um, when you think of the breadth of uh, the past power of leaders, um, it's a very different past um, than the uh, way that the continent is subdivided uh, in the 21st century, which is a um, reflection of European colonialism. Um, and so um, this is the Kora, um, one of the major um, uh, musical instruments uh, that is performed, uh, that, that has historically been performed at courts um, along with the balafon. And um, here you have a um, early representation of balafon players um, uh, depicted by a Dogon master of the 16th century. And one of the things that's interesting uh, to consider about the forms of expression that we've assembled in this exhibition is that they span every medium um, from stone, fired clay, carved wood, um, but because of the landscape, which is very dry, um, wood sculpture here has survived for many, many centuries, um, much longer than it um, does in other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, this is a region where we have some of the earliest wood sculptures that are known from Africa. Now, um, I said that um, Arab traders began regularly making the journey across the Sahara from North Africa at the end of the seventh century, and that that brought with it uh, literacy as well as trade. And the other thing that it brought with uh, along with it was uh, the introduction of Islam. And uh, from the um, 12th century on, uh, many leaders in the Sahel begin embracing uh, Islam. And so, uh, for example, the um, Emperor of Mali, uh, Sundiata, who is the subject of the epic poem that I just mentioned, uh, identified as Muslim. And um, he um, sponsors important centers of Islamic learning in what is present day Mali in cities like Timbuktu. Um, as well as important um, sites for prayer. Um, the largest uh, adobe mosques, um, uh, the, the largest structures in this region are adobe mosques. Um, and you see um, in the background one of these um, uh, that we have used um, as a blow up photograph uh, to situate you. Uh, but uh, Islam is highly customized by regional leaders um, who also are very tolerant of the continuation of religious practices um, followed by their constituents um, and so um, they are very fair about who to convert. Um, and, and in the Middle Ages, you have a very diverse situation where Islam is um, shoulder to shoulder with um, ancestral veneration uh, that had been previously in place. 
Um, and we see that in, for example, this context where um, this is um, a, an ancient mosque um, that was um, built in the Middle Ages um, at a site known as Kumbi Saleh, uh, believed to be the capital of the ancient empire of Ghana. This is a site in present day Mauritania. Um, ancient Ghana was the earliest of the Sahelian states. It preceded ancient Mali. Um, and this little terracotta figurine on the right is a votive object, um, doubtless um, created as part of rites of fertility for um, some kind of altar. Uh, and um, these two artif um, this uh, site for prayer um, and this um, what Muslims of the, the time would refer to as idols um, were being used contemporaneously. Uh, one of the interesting things to know about this, this modest little figurine, um, which we have on loan from the National Museum of Mauritania, is that archaeologists found it um, in an ancient garbage midden um, adjacent to this mosque many centuries after it had been extensively used. Um, and so this kind of contextualization of ancient artifacts from this region gives us a sense that people were very much involved in um, significant changes that were being introduced um, from the outside world um, and that um, religious practices were undergoing, continually undergoing uh, reevaluation. Now, why, what was the motivation for trans-Saharan trade? Um, and, and actually I should say that the the journey across this sea of sand was a very challenging one that lasted that um, lasted over 70 days um, by camel. And the camel was referred to as the ship of the desert. Uh, and um, the motivation for making this arduous journey was that um, in the lands of the Sahel, there were, and there continue to be, prodigious um, gold mines. And uh, we are told uh, that uh, during the Middle Ages, uh, during the late Middle Ages in Europe, three quarters of the gold in circulation was originally sourced in the Sahel and ferried across the Sahara Desert. Um, so this was the prime commodity um, that um, was ferried um, through these arteries of exchange. And um, although um, you know, gold was essentially um, um, a raw material that was then uh, transformed into coinage um, in North Africa and beyond. Um, we actually have very few examples of gold artifacts that were created for local consumption. Uh, and this, um, gorgeous pectoral. Uh, this is actually an ornament that was worn um, on the chest. Um, it has a suspension lug at the summit. It's over six ounces of gold um, that have been cast 
uh, in a uh, tour de force of metallurgy uh, uh, and was um, found in present day Senegal within one of those burial tumuli accompanying a young man um, who appears to have been a warrior. He was um, buried with this ornament, a number of other uh, gold beads and several weapons. Um, and uh, this artifact um, clearly was, um, you know, a prestige object, um, the very fine workmanship. Um, it includes um, granulation and filigree reflect an awareness of Islamic techniques of metalworking. And thus um, it's, it's a sign of all kinds of exchanges of knowledge of working metals that were happening um, through these um, arteries of exchange. Um, but um, interestingly, um, historians tell us that you know, gold was in such, was so widely available in the Sahel that it wasn't the most precious of the metals uh, that um, local people valued. Instead, um, here's a work that is roughly contemporaneous, um, also produced in the region, um, that is, um, that probably was even more highly valued um, because of the fine, um, uh, even more technically challenging processes of successive castings of combined copper and brass, which creates all kinds of beautiful chromatic complexity. Um, and you can see here, um, this is such a, an original composition, this miniature head uh, with these enormous raised arms um, holding staves of leadership. Um, and this is um, a work that was not um, found in an archeological context. Um, so it's un undocumented, um, but historians um, believe um, that it probably belonged to a um, member of the court of the emperor of Mali. Now, um, this is um, a map that was uh, one of the most advanced maps of its day. Um, it was produced in Mallorca, uh, which was a, a, a major center for cartography in the Middle Ages. Uh, and um, it gives us a sense of how this region of Sub-Saharan Africa was imagined by Europeans uh, during uh, the late Middle Ages. Uh, and you can see in this little detail a depiction of the emperor of Mali holding up a nugget of gold uh, and um, looking up at a Berber trader mounted on a camel. And what does the emperor of Mali look like? Well, he looks like the king of France. He's wearing a European crown um, and he's holding a scepter. Um, and he's sitting on a throne. Um, and, um, but on this map, um, he is um, known to be an incredibly powerful leader. Uh, and um, he's known by name. Uh, this is um, one of the great emper emperors of Mali, Mansa Musa, who became a worldwide celebrity 
in the 15th century um, when he made a historic voyage to Mecca and stopped in Cairo on his way uh, with, uh, it said, uh, according to legend, um, some 100 camel loads of gold. And he spent during this voyage so prodigiously that he caused a crash, worldwide crash in the value of gold for decades. Um, and the goal of this journey uh, by Mansa Musa was to um, make the Hajj, uh, a pilgrimage. Uh, and uh, this literally puts him on the map as a peer to his other contemporaries who are depicted um, in relation to other parts of the world. Um, so you can see that um, this is the way um, that um, this region was imagined um, very early on in history. Uh, and it's the way that um, to this day in history books, the em empire of Mali is illustrated um, in survey books um, with a European image of uh, the emperor Mansa Musa. And one of my, um, this is a, um, a picture of um, the landscape, um, but one of my goals with this exhibition was to give you a Sahelian um, artist envisioning of what greater, what great leaders look like um, rather than be wedded to this um, persistence of using European representations. Um, and um, once again, here we have a, um, an equestrian warrior um, that is um, produced by a Sahelian sculptor um, out of fired clay, um, but um, uh, this work um, shows that um, the clay was actually carved into, um, uh, there's a lot of very fine detail um, before it was fired. Um, and it's interesting to consider that um, this equestrian is contemporaneous with that map depicting Mansa Musa. Um, it's probably uh, a member of the cavalry of the emperor of Mali, but because it's an archeological artifact and there aren't many local there aren't any local written texts from this period, we can only imagine who its subject is. Uh, and this work, um, which was produced in the area of central Mali, that is um, on the shores of the Niger River, um, experienced a, an explosion of creativity between the 12th and 14th century uh, when hundreds of um, fired clay sculptures of this kind were produced for local shrines. And here you have a sense of some of the variety that these figures take uh, that we've assembled in the installation. And the one that is um, most um, important as a loan to this exhibition is a centerpiece of the National Museum of Mali in Bamako, one of the only examples found by archaeologists in situ. Uh, and you can see this very prosperous, corpulent, reclining figure uh, has lots of jewelry. Um, but obviously he's missing his head. And the archeologists who found this work um, 
tell us that it was deliberately destroyed before it was deposited once again in a refuse pile. Um, so we have another instance of an ancient work that was cherished for hundreds of years um, and then cast off. Um, and the casting off of this work corresponds once again with another rise in the importance of Islam in communities in the vicinity where it was uh, deployed. Now, um, I am getting close to end time, so I'm just going to um, very rapidly um, show you a few more works. Um, one of the things that um, we're, we tried to do, as I said before, is to give you a sense of creativity in all idioms, including textiles um, and like wood, um, we have some of the earliest wo uh, woven textiles known um, from Sub-Saharan Africa, specifically from this region, and they are in the exhibition. And um, here I've juxtaposed um, a 15th century archeological textile um, with one that um, was collected by Europeans um, European traders in the 17th century. And you can see a continuity in design fashions um, across um, number of centuries. Um, and this is a fashion that continues to be important to this day in the Sahel. Uh, and uh, here you have um, a 16th century work um, from uh, the uh, tradition of the Telem and Dogon peoples, um, another major moment in Sahelian uh, creative expression. Um, and this is one of my favorite works in the exhibition. Um, I like to refer to it as the Dogon Vitruvian Man. Um, it gives you a sense and microcosm of the place of humankind um, within the cosmos. Um, here on the screen, you have um, front and back of this figure, which is very minimal minimalistic in terms of creating a backdrop for a miniaturized human being. Um, and the raised arm gesture is one that gets repeated over and over again in Dogon art, um, a prayer for rain and for the regeneration of life uh, in this area that is so arid and that today is um, suffering enormously from climate change um, that has precipitated massive migrations out of the region um, to Europe. Uh, and finally, uh, the traditions that we present in the exhibition culminate uh, with that of the Bamana, uh, a, um, a, a culture and an empire uh, that arose in this area of the Sahel in present day Mali uh, in the 18th century. And um, here we have a photograph on the left of the capital of the mighty city uh, of Segu um, that was also one of the most powerful states um, towards the uh, end of the autonomy of this region uh, before it gets colonized by the French. Uh, and we have assembled um, on the final platform, 
a grouping of courtiers, um, members of the elite um, who would have populated um, the, uh, uh, the Segu court. Uh, and among the figures uh, that are the most uh, majestic are those of regal queenly figures um, enthroned uh, wearing the headdresses of male leaders uh, uh, protectively nurturingly holding to their bodies um, their offspring uh, the idea of women as the source of life and the shaping of future generations. Um, and they are at the center of um, the celebration of, um, of civilization at the Segu court um, and surrounded uh, by all kinds of retainers um, here you have um, two examples of women bearing vessels on their head um, and uh, one still retains the very crisp lines um, of uh, the sculpture, whereas one on the left um, has been heavily eroded from hundreds of years of um, use. Uh, and uh, these uh, female vessel bearers um, are carrying um, water, which is um, an offering uh, of um, refreshment um, and hospitality to visitors of the court and also um, essential to the sustenance of life. Um, and here you see among uh, the protagonists in the foreground, um, not only musicians who are performing the epics that sing to the greatness of these assembled uh, courtiers, uh, but in the foreground, the ubiquitous equestrian warrior, the male leader who is uh, the vanquor um, and um, the uh, prevailing over um, all who um, attempt to um, infringe on um, his, uh, his state. Um, this is the, the emperor himself um, with his entourage. Um, and he, in our installation, um, is at the very end of the Cavalcade Avenue. Um, I have, um, I'm at 55 minutes. So um, I wanna turn things over now to questions so that um, I can answer things that um, you would like me to address. Thank you, Elisa. I'll give you a applause for the, for the for the crowd. That was extraordinary. Um, uh, yeah, we're really uh, there's some there's some good questions coming in here. Um, I just want to jump in and really quick and with those figures um, that you were just showing and um, in particular, I guess, are they is there? Do we know how they were actually displayed? Like in their time, in their, you know, like, would they, would they be sort of as, as an altar or would it be something arranged with like the royalty or, you know, in, in the homes of the people? It seemed like, it actually seemed like a lot of those sculptures were just sort of regular, regular people. I mean, um, like the musicians and such. So uh, you're, you're asking about the, the group of sculptures at the very end of the exhibition on the platform? Yeah, more, okay. about, more about those, yeah. Okay, so um, thanks for that question. Uh, if I had endless time, I would have given you um, a dissertation on those figures. Um, they essentially are sculptures that are commissioned 
to be displayed publicly um, as a way of um, visualizing values that are important to inculcate in members of society. Um, so the sculptures are commissioned by elders. Um, they're displayed only a few times annually um, in a public gathering place. And they are the uh, springboard for conversations in the community um, about the um, values um, associated with good governance, um, with responsible leadership, with um, uh, behavior that should be praised. Um, um, so these are the role models um, and they're, they're, they're not portraits of specific people in the community. They're more allegorical as representations. Um, and they aren't owned by any one individual, um, but rather collectively owned by the community. And one of the things that is um, interesting to reflect on, uh, unlike um, our notion of a monument, which is always in the public, um, meeting place um, and um, uh, almost becomes something that um, we become so either, um, uh, it's so much part of our background that we tune it out and um, don't really notice it or um, obviously um, right now we're, we have a heightened, um, sensitivity to um, realizing the impact that um, monuments are having on members of our communities. Um, these, because they're only seen for brief moments um, that are shared, uh, it's, it's a very special thing to be exposed to them. And so people marvel when these works come out on display. It's a, almost a, a form of still theater. Uh, and um, it really is something that um, people look forward to throughout the year. Um, okay, I'm going to jump on a question we had earlier um, that might tie into that from Janelle. She asks, uh, you have associated equated equestrian society with our the United States Confederate, our history traditions, as one is a ritual of domination, expressions, symbols of human consumptions. Why is equestrian society valued in sub-Saharan Africa? She says, thank you for a highly informative presentation. Oh, thank you for the question. Um, uh, I mean, I, I just mentioned Confederate monuments because that is something that is part of the, you know, the national conversation at this moment. Um, but it is um, in the Sahel completely divorced from our own history um, of the Civil War. Um, but, you know, Sahelian history uh, ultimately is our history as well, because um, this is um, a region that is the heritage of so many of us who uh, became part of the Americas um, through the transatlantic uh, slave trade. So um, it's important for us to be aware of monuments that about leadership and power um, that were developed independently in this part of the world. 
um, and that celebrate the power um, and confidence and um, and victories of um, the leaders of the Malian Empire, of um, the Bamana Segu Empire. Um, and um, as I mentioned, the horse was a precious commodity. Um, it was very prestigious and um, it was here too associated with um, military dominance. Okay, I have a, a good, some good questions here from Mark. Uh, Mark says, thank you so much for the talk. It is a real pleasure to experience the exhibition with you. I have been looking forward to the exhibition for years, knowing that it was coming. I worked at the US Embassy in Niger and was aware of the preparations. It was a shame that I could not make it to the city to see the, ex the exhibit with my own eyes. So I'm grateful for your introduction. Uh, he has a few questions. Can you describe the Met's collaboration and partnership with African institutions, given historical mistrust with Western institutions and a movement to reclaim art taken during colonial times? Um, he's got a few questions. What does other African, how, what does other African art compare? I'm aware of prehistoric cave paintings, Zimbabwean stone structures, and Egyptian polemic art in Egypt, but how does Sahelian art compare? Are there distinctive features of Sahelian work? Thank you. Um, thank you, Mark, for um, you know, being part of the teams on the ground that were critical to all of the complex um, arrangements that um, had to be developed over many, many years of conversations in order to bring this exhibition to life. And um, I have to say, um, one of, I mean, it makes me, on the one hand, very sad that um, after so many years of you know, five, four and a half years of planning and execution, um, the pandemic um, really um, deprived this one venue exhibition of the audience that um, we hoped that it would reach. Uh, but the real joy of this project um, has ultimately been very meaningful conversations and partnerships um, that it was intended to forge with institutions in the region. Um, and as you know from your work in Niger at the embassy, our sister institutions, national museums in Niger and EMA, um, in Nouakchott and Mauritania are institutions um, that um, have great challenges um, in terms of the resources that are allocated for to them um, and the care of their collections. And um, part of the partnership um, was to um, offer the means to conserve works that we borrowed, the wonderful national treasure from Niger, the equestrian warrior. Um, underwent uh, conservation when it arrived and it's actually, um, we have a couple of weeks of work that is going to be undertaken um, before it gets sent back. And the other um, part of this was really to, um, and I think it was very meaningful and important to my counterparts at those institutions who were with us, um, thankfully, uh, in January at the launch uh, before the pandemic, um, it was very meaningfully meaningful for them to come together in New York City, have the 
importance of the collections that they care for recognized at a place like the Metropolitan. And um, one of the things that was quite remarkable was that the museum professionals in Mali, in Niger, Mauritania, Senegal had never met each other before. Um, and um, they became not only part of our Met family, but they um, spoke to us about how meaningful it was to be part of a larger community within the region of museum professionals and to be thinking in terms of regional history rather than simply national history, which is um, a reflection of uh, really only the, the last 60 years. So um, I think that, um, you know, what we started with this project um, is to develop long-term relationships of exchange that we um, are very much wanting to build upon. Um, and I think that in the conversations um, about restitution, which are complex, it is incredibly important that um, a priority be given to strengthening uh, the infrastructure and the professional capacity of uh, na national museums um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it's incredible. Uh, I don't think a lot of people realize how I, I don't just how extensive your your work is and the the years that you put into it and all the relationship building. It's amazing. Um, here's an easy question: Is there a catalog from Myra? <laughs> Yes, there is a catalog, thankfully. Um, it's, you know, exhibitions, even without COVID, are fleeting experiences. Um, and, um, you know, I, one of the things that I love doing as a curator, my two favorite um, activities are designing with the exhibition designer, the installation that is such a, of, of such limited duration, but then working with the editor on a publication that will last forever, hopefully. Um, and the thing that is um, very special about the um, Sahel catalog is that um, it is a, it's basically the, you know, when I was doing research on the exhibition, I was having to read um, and, and learning so much in specialized academic literature research articles that, um, you know, are synthesized and, um, you know, uh, this, this is, in a sense, a survey book of um, Sahelian art history that didn't previously exist. Uh, and what's really important about it is that the stars in this survey are works, um, as mentioned in response to Mark's question, that reside in the institutions in the region. Uh, and many of my colleagues from the region are authors in this catalog. So it's a text that, um, in which I was able to invite archeologists, philosopher, historians, um, and um, myself as an art historian. Um, to um, author, uh, so it has a <clears throat> multidisciplinary um, perspective that it brings to bear on the heritage of the Sahel. And um, the reason 
to do that is that um, we can't get a full understanding of this past from just the archaeology or just the history or just the art history. You really have to um, bring them together in a single volume to get a sense of um, the complexity and the scope of what happened. And for me, what is most original about this exhibition and the book is that um, you know, historians have written extensively about these great states that I mentioned in the beginning, but we're approaching this past by looking at the creations of artists from the region as precious primary sources that the historians haven't really engaged with until now. Um, African art history often talks about the beauty of the artifacts from Sub-Saharan Africa, but decontextualizes them and approaches them as timeless creations. And this is about grounding these works in different moments of history and trying to put ourselves in the creative imagination of people who we know a little bit about from history, um, but the marriage of what they produced with the history um, begins to bring it to life for us. Um, I think you, the exhibition shows a lot of that too. And there, there's a question about the relaxed pose of so many of the sculptures and the, the raised bumps on their skin. Um, from Actually, I'm, I'm glad that you um, mentioned the raised bumps on the skin. I'm, there's um, the, a series of figures that are quite monumental and fired clay that I flashed on the screen um, that um, one of the things that um, is distinctive about them is um, uh, that feature and um, one of, nobody knows what that refers to. Um, some art historians and archeologists have suggested that it was um, perhaps um, the artists referring to some deliberate form of bodily decoration, but others have suggested, and it's actually kind of, you know, the moment that we're living in um, really brings it home is that through trade networks, um, it's possible that a pandemic was introduced um, into the inner Niger Delta during the period in which these works were produced. Um, and that this is um, a reference to either smallpox or to the bubonic plague. Um, and I mentioned that there was this explosion of creativity between the 12th and 14th century. And um, because these are devotional sculptures, people have wondered whether the ones with these raised markings might have been on altars uh, referring, uh, asking for um, uh, relief uh, from illness. There's, there's such a synergy between these figures and the, um, like the, the structure you showed of that they're, they're continually rebuilding you know, with the wood coming out. And there's that great video in the exhibition that shows the community building it. Um, yeah, I love that video. Um, it, it was um, shot by Susan Vogel, uh, who uh, is an African art historian who was the first um, curator of African art at the Metropolitan and the director of the Museum for 
African art and its founder. Um, and she captures in the video um, the annual resurfacing of the great mosque of Jenne and what a joyous event that is that all, although the main responsibility of resurfacing the great mosque, which is a UNESCO world heritage site um, is the responsibility of professional masons who are mature men um, everybody participates. Little kids are gathering the mud um, and um, adolescents are um, handing it up to the Masons. And it's just, um, you know, all hands on deck and everybody contributes to this great civic undertaking. Uh, and it really gives you a sense of, um, as I was um, suggesting earlier that, um, you know, the past is continually refreshed and um, that um, ancient monuments are um, renewed uh, by uh, the, the community. Um, I have, there's a couple more questions if you're, if you're still feeling. Sure. Okay. Um, this is from Jock. Uh, Jock is asking, there's a, and part of my pronunciation, there's a Dijen Terracotta. Terracotta in the Mets permanent collection and often on display. It is not in the Sahel show. Why? And is there a reason it doesn't fit in? Yeah, thanks for that question. I actually, um, I didn't include hardly any works from the Metz collection in the Sahel exhibition. And I did it for two reasons. I wanted to bring to New Yorkers and to what I thought would be international visitors as well, but you know, we haven't had very many of them because of COVID, um, as many unfamiliar works um, to tell this story as possible. And I also wanted to create a situation where you could see parallel works in the Rockefeller wing and in this new Sahel installation. And because of the simultaneity of those two displays, see how differently these works could be experienced when you ground them historically and with more of a sense of the uh, culture of the region. Uh, you'll notice that in the Sahel installation, not only do we have the sounds of the Jenne community uh, resurfacing the mosque, but we also have um, chora music by the master chora player, Tumani Diabate. And, um, and you don't have any of that in the um, Michael C. Rockefeller wing where the permanent collection is on display. And, um, we are, for the past four years, we've been, or five years now, we've been um, preparing a major re-envisioning and renovation of the Michael C. Rockefeller wing. We're gonna be disassembling it um, in its entirety. First, we're gonna be taking down um, the Oceanic collection in January and by, the beginning of next of this coming summer, we'll be deinstalling the entire Africa and ancient Americas collections, uh, and uh, the work that's going to be done on the wing is um, going to be completed in 2024. Um, and so, the that installation in the Rockefeller wing is really. Um, only going to be accessible to the public for, uh, you know, 
less than a year and I didn't want to take everything off you for this uh, temporary exhibition, but rather use the temporary exhibition as an opportunity to see similar works from a new perspective. And when we reinstall the collection, some of the things that we've done in Sahel will be in integrated into the new experience of the African galleries at the Met. So um, for that reason, um, I'm glad that you noticed. Um, I didn't take any of the Bamana figures off of the platform. I didn't um, remove most of our Dogon works. Um, I really wanted to the stars of this exhibition to be the works that we brought over from Sub-Saharan Africa and um, major institutions across the U.S. and Europe. Um, okay. Um, so it's even it makes it even more special to go now when you can see both at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Bring that up again. Um, Deborah is asking if the exhibition include, does the exhibition include tools that may have been used to recreate the annual resurfacing of monuments and the carving of sculptural forms? In addition to carving, was there evidence of fabricated sculptures? Um, no, we don't have any tools in the exhibition. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, my, sense of um, the resurfacing of the mosque is, you know, it's, it's sort of like working with wet cement, you have a dowel and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, the terracottas are ancient works and I, I'm not aware that the tools that were used, um, you know, with, um, to produce any of them um, have ever been unearthed by archaeologists. Um, and, you know, the, the main tool that um, the wood sculptures were produced with um, is the ads. Um, and it, it's pretty amazing to consider the extraordinary, those monumental Bamana figures um, as, you know, blocks of wood uh, produced by a sculptor with a very simple ads. Um, it's the, I mean, a, a really uh, without usually a preparatory sketch of any kind, no room for erasures or corrections, um, you know, really having it in his head and um, bringing the wood to life. Just a couple more. Uh, and there's an anonymous question. Why was Burkina Faso not included? Uh, we, we focused on the Western Sahel um, from the Atlantic coast in Senegal to the bend of the Niger River in Niger uh, because we were you know, looking at um, the, the the, the centers where these um, ancient empires were really concentrated. Um, so it just didn't fit in with the, the historical narrative that we were uh, emphasizing. Could, could I ask you just to talk a little more about, at the beginning you were talking about the city of the dead. Oh yeah, so the, um, the Bora Equestrian was in a, um, what's often referred to as a necropolis. It was a, you know, very elaborate, um, uh, pretty extensive uh, burial plot uh, that um, where individuals, um, uh, who appear to have been important 
people in their lifetimes uh, were buried under terracotta sculptures. So that equestrian um, in antiquity seems like it was positioned above the burial site of the warrior who it celebrates. Uh, and uh, a, a Nigerian archeologist, Bube Gado, um, in the 1970s and 80s excavated that site and um, all of the things that were found there are part of uh, the, inst the Institute for Research um, in Niger. And um, the dating is a very approximate third to eighth century. Um, but, and we don't really know that much about um, uh, you know, I mean, there, there are no written records at all about Bura civilization, except for the sculptures that survive. But we know that it is evidence of the fact that these polities predate the arrival of Arab traders um, developing these, um, I mean, at, at one point, um, many generations ago, history texts emphasized that Trans-Saharan trade was what fueled the development of empires in the Sahel. And this kind of archaeological evidence, along with the megalith, and you know, some of the other early artifacts that we assembled in Sahel are evidence that that, that is not at all the case, that these states were in place um, and fairly well developed before the first Arabs arrive and that they were part of regional trade networks that were very cosmopolitan, very sophisticated um, and that um, trade across the Sahara simply got grafted on to pre-existing trade net networks. Well, um, I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, thank you again. And I uh, think you is just so generous. And, you know, I think you paint a picture from the inside out with this exhibition. It's really beautiful. And I'll say it again, please, if you if you're able to see the show, um, please do go and make sure you, you the show ends on October 26. Um, and yeah, that's it. Well, thank you for having me and um, everybody stay safe and healthy and um, now watch the debate. <laughs> Have a nice evening. Okay, thank you. Bye.